You're listening to Jared Morris. Call Jared now at 945-9292. Toll free in Maryland, 1-800-518-9292. Or free on the Verizon Wireless Network. Pound 927 on your cell phones. All right, 1113, this is the Talk of Delmarva. 945-9292 is the telephone number. Been looking forward to talking to this guest for the last couple of days, and it's kind of neat the way it kind of just fell into the uh, into the show um, because I've been thinking about trying to get in contact with him to talk to him a little bit a little bit about his movie that he has out and and some other things as well. Ray Comfort is here. Ray is from uh, among other things, he's an author. He's written over seventy books, including helping to compile the Evidence Bible. He's worked on uh, with Kirk Cameron blogs and uh, the way of the master website and the way of the master tv show which you can find on some of the uh, on some of the cable networks around here and uh, really has just been has been uh, all around hey ray how you doing i'm doing good thanks Jared. uh i want to talk to you I, a little bit to begin with about about the movie it's called 180 the movie and uh well, how would you describe how, i see it's called a documentary in some of the uh in some of the press about this how would you describe the movie to people if you were trying to tell them about it well let me give you a bit of background so it kind of makes sense i i was writing a book for uh, world net daily called hitler god and the bible and i said to them i will uh, give you a video to go with it called hitler's religion that's a very fascinating subject so i took a camera out in the streets and came back horrified because they had 14 people on camera mainly university students who didn't have a clue who Adolf Hitler was. Shocking. That threw me for a loop. Yeah. And then I thought, I'll go back to these students and put them in a moral dilemma. Uh, while researching the book, I read of an horrific incident where uh, the Nazis shot 300 Jews in a pit and then brought in bulldozers to bury them while some of them are still alive. So I said to these kids, or these university students, uh, would you, at the point of a Nazi gun, bury Jews that are still alive? And they said, no, I could never do that. And I said, why is that? Because you value human life? And they said, yeah. I said, how do you feel about abortion? And they said, oh, it's a woman's choice. And so I said, do you think it's a baby in the womb? And they said, yeah, yeah. So then I asked them one question, which to my surprise caused them to change their minds about the issue of abortion. So when we were in the studio, we looked at our, at our clippings, and we saw that we had eight people who were adamantly pro-abortion becoming pro-life in a matter of seconds because they were asked one question. We realized we didn't have a Hitler Hitler's religion video, but a, uh, a video uh, on a pro-life issue, issue, so we changed the name to 180, put it on a uh, website, 180movie.com, and to date, eight months later, it's had 3.1 million views. And so we're very excited because people on the video not only changed their minds about abortion, but people watching it actually changed their minds about the issue of abortion. So that's very thrilling. Were you, in the movie, it starts out with, uh, with that, asking people about Adolf Hitler and uh, many of the people that you talked to didn't have any idea, mostly young people, who Adolf Hitler was. I mean, how shocking is that? Well, it really shows the education system is letting them down because these, these, these people are not idiots. Some people say they're dumb, but they're university students that try to further their education. Um, mandatory Holocaust education is, is, uh, is only in five states, and, and it seems like 45 states are dropping the ball with this issue. But you mentioned about the beginning of the video. It also begins with a guy named Steve who is a Jew-hating, black-hating, America-hating, Hitler-loving, neo-Nazi atheist with a 14-inch blue mohawk. Uh, he's a very interesting character. So the whole thing is a roller coaster ride of emotions, very fast-moving, very well-produced by a team. And, uh, and uh, so we encourage people to watch it, because once you start, you can't stop. When I first heard about the movie, um, I, I'd seen, seen the, uh, the trailer online and some of the promotional material, and I got to be honest with you. The first thing I thought was, well, this is you know this is an an anti-abortion movie, and the the typical Ray Comfort uh, uh, t- technique, the the gospel message, it's it's not here. Uh, I, I was worried that you'd veered away from the from the gospel message, but I guess that's not true, right? Oh yeah, someone said to us, this is a very powerful pro-life movie. Drop the gospel message out. I thought to myself, you've got more chance of flossing the back teeth of the lions of the L.A. Zoo at feeding time as you have of taking the gospel out because what the gospel does is it deals with the heart. I don't want someone walking away from me and saying, boy, you've changed my mind. I'm now pro-life, but I'm still pro-homosexual marriage and uh, pro-pornography. I don't want that. I want to see a heart change. So if you can 
uh, see the heart change through the gospel, the moment someone becomes a Christian, they immediately become pro-life. They immediately become marriage as one man, one woman. They immediately become uh, anti-pornography because they love the things that God loves. They've got a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. So if you can get the train on the right track, the carriages of the worldview will fall into line, and that's our agenda. When, you, when you're talking to some of the students in the movie, there's one part where you say that even, uh, and I think it was to uh, uh, one of the women or the, the young ladies in the movie that had had, I think she had had an abortion, uh, you'd say that even abortion is not an unforgivable sin. Uh, I, I've read some things on, the, on your Facebook page and comments people have made. They, they're not seeming to get that that's part of the message as well. Yeah, on our Facebook page is uh, 317,000 likes. So there were a lot of people that are from uh, different persuasions other than myself. A lot of them are non-Christians. So they do say things that, that I don't agree with, but they've got the right to do that. But yeah, God can forgive uh, any sin except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible. He will forgive, and he, and he, and he does. And so uh, forgiveness is open to whosoever will. But the key, I think, that's made 180 so uh, popular and so well-received is the fact that it does something different than all other pro-life movies. As much as pro-life movies movies done a great job in the past, what we do is we t we stayed away from pictures of aborted uh, babies, uh, mm -hmm. graphic pictures, and we appeal to the uh, intuitive uh, conscience, the inner knowledge of right and wrong that every human being has got. You know, a lot of university students are taught that we're nothing but, but uh, primates, and there's no uh, absolute sense of right and wrong. What we believe is that, that we're different than the animals, that God has made us with a sense of moral uh, understanding. Um, uh, animals don't set up court systems. My dog couldn't care less if some other dog steals his bone. He doesn't want to prosecute, but we do as human beings. Uh, we have a sense of justice and truth and righteousness because we're made in the image of God. We spend billions of dollars on court systems. Last year, $64 billion just uh, to uh, um, house criminals. That's nothing to do with prosecution, so we, we care about right and wrong, and that's what we tapped into, the knowledge of right and wrong. Every one of us knows it's wrong to steal and to lie and to commit adultery, and we also know it's wrong to kill. So if you can get someone to admit that it's a baby in the womb and then say to them, okay, justify the killing of a baby in the womb. It's okay to kill a baby in the womb when? If their conscience is doing its duty, they'll have a hard job coming up with anything, even the whole rape issue uh, uh, falls down under that light. You know, you don't kill the baby for the crime of the father. If some woman is raped, you go after the rapist and prosecute him. You don't take the life of the child. You let the child live. It's yet another one of the problems, though, Ray, that uh, seemingly can be washed away by just embracing the gospel. That, Like you said before, if people have that, that change of heart, then they are going to change their mind. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also another little benefit, too. You get everlasting life. We <laughs> kind of forget that. <laughs> but, um, that's the promise of God, that he will give everlasting life to all those that come to Christ. And the thing that convinced me that I was a sinner more than anything else was just one Bible verse where Jesus said, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already within his heart. And I remember looking at that scripture and being pinned against the wall and saying to myself, man, on judgment day, I'm going to be guilty a million times over. I'm going to end up in hell. And it was then for the first time that I realized that I'd broken God's law, but Jesus had paid my fine, which meant I could be legally, uh, I could legally have my case dismissed. God could release me from the courtroom because my fine was paid for by another who uh, suffered for me and then rose from the dead. And so when you repent and trust Christ, not only do you get a new heart with new desires, but you get the gift of everlasting life, and you're taken out of futility of death, and that's an unspeakable joy that I want to share with this dying world. Is, is that missing from some presentations of the modern gospel, though? I've even heard it say that uh, when you talk to Christians about the need to repent, that that's a works-based gospel and, uh, and that that's a false doctrine. What do you say to that? Well, the Bible says God commands all men everywhere to repent. So it's, we're told to repent, so that's all there is to it. It's not works-based. You, uh, you can't earn eternal life, but you can receive it. If, you, if I'm going to give you a free parachute to jump with, and you've got to turn around to receive it if you're facing the other way. And each of us are facing the other way. And we've got to turn around to receive the gift of everlasting life. So it's not faith-based, uh, not uh, works-based at all. But you're right. Many, many uh, preachers uh, that are in pulpits should have been plumbers or electricians. Uh, they're nothing more than, motion, than motivational speakers that are very gifted and have huge congregations. But they're not men of God who preach the truth. They're not uh, sons of thunder 
that uh, that preach the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the justice of God. And when you leave that out, Christianity becomes just another form of uh, self-improvement. It becomes uh, um, uh, worthless in the eyes of the world. Jesus said when the salt has lost its savor, when it's got no taste to it, uh, it's worth nothing and gets trampled on a foot of men. And that's exactly what's happened with the church. We've become irrelevant in the world because we haven't uh, spoken up clearly uh, as we should have. Well, not only irrelevant, I mean, people, and I, I'm speaking from experience here, uh, are, are combative towards Christians because of the way the world or the way that uh, a, a lot of the modern church presents itself, that you think that this is what the church is, this is what Christianity is, uh, and it couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah, you've got the, the extremes, the Whisper Baptist Church, who are saying God hates fags and holding up signs and just being a terrible, terrible uh, reproach to the church. And then you've got the other side, which is just nothing but wishy-washy uh, a medicine that's been so watered down it's lost its curative properties. But everyone uh, should seek God for themselves and open the Bible and see what we should be doing and, and then begin doing it, because we as a nation are in a, in, a, in, a, in a terrible mess, and the root of that mess is idolatry. Um, you know, we're right from the White House to the man in the street. They've got their own perception of what God is like. And from that, if you've got a God that has no moral dictate, you can do what you want. You can kill babies in the womb. You can have homosexuals marry, marry each other. You can do all sorts of things that are an abomination to God. And uh, your God feels good about it. But in truth, your God doesn't exist. He's a figment of the imagination. Uh, there's one God. He's holy. He's righteous. He has demands. He commands us to repent. He tells us there's going to be a judgment day. And there's a very real hell because God is good. And if he is good, he must have his day of justice and punish people like Hitler. But he's so good, he's going to punish rapists and liars and thieves and fornicators and blasphemers. And that leaves us all in big trouble. <clears throat> so it's, it's, a vi- it's vital that we uh, preach the truth about God's character and nature, and that will send us to the foot of the cross. Uh, we were talking before about, um, about the way that the message is, is presented. And you're right, there's both extremes. There's uh, the wishy-washy and the other as well. Uh, so that leads, I think, right into a discussion about about false conversion. Um, if you're being, I, I don't, I don't want to say misled, but if you're being led by somebody who's not giving you the entire gospel, and you're not out there, and you're not reading the Bible every day, and you're not trying to uh, to decipher the truth, uh, that's what that can lead to. How how big of a problem is is false conversion, right? It's absolutely huge. Uh, our churches are filled with false converts. We've got millions of people that profess to be Christians, that profess to love God, and yet we don't even have the political clout to outlaw the murder of children in the womb. Uh, and that's what's happened. Uh, we've, uh, we've filled our churches with false converts because instead of preaching the narrow gate and saying it's very difficult to become a Christian, we've said it's real easy, just give your heart to Jesus. And so we've uh, opened up the door and let the world come into the church. Now the world and the church almost the same thing. And uh, Jesus warned about this in Matthew seven twenty one through to about 26. You'll see that he warned that many would say to him on Judgment Day, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, Depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. I never knew you. That's a direct reference to the Ten Commandments. We have people who say, I'm a Christian, but they lie and steal. I'm a Christian, but they use God's name in vain. They say, I'm a Christian, but their eyes wander uh, sexually at, into places they shouldn't go. Um, that's called hypocrisy, and the Bible says hypocrites will not inherit the kingdom of God. So hypocrites offend almost all of us. None of us like hypocrisy, but what hypocr- hypocrisy does is it's self-blinding. We can be hypocrites and not really realize it. And so it's important that we do what the Bible says and examine ourselves and see if we're in the, in the truth. And if we're not in the faith, if we're not, if we're playing the hypocrite, the only thing we're fooling is ourselves. The only one, we're not fooling our friends, we're not fooling God. So very important that we're genuine in our faith, truly repentant and trusting in Christ daily for our salvation. Why is it, wor- why is it worth the effort to do that? I, 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 this is a question I keep going through in my head. For somebody that is pretending or, or they think they're one thing or uh, you know, they're putting on a show for the world, what's the benefit to people to do that? Why do they even bother? Isn't it easier just to, to denounce God, to denounce Christianity? Yeah, but it means that you can have a sense of uh, God's smile upon your life, which we all want, and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Most people, you know, the, the guy who said as miserable as sin didn't know what he was talking about. Sin isn't miserable, it's very pleasurable. You know, you can, you can, you can enjoy uh, pornography, you can enjoy uh, uh, adultery. There's a sense of excitement about stealing. You know, a lot of guys rob and steal because of the, 
the adrenaline rush, the thrill they get. But just because something is pleasurable doesn't mean to say that it's right. And, uh, and so we have multitudes of people who, who love their sins and want to hold on to the fact that, oh, yeah, I'm going to heaven. And that comes back to the uh, delusion of idolatry, having a wrong understanding of God's character and nature. The Bible says we have to give an account of every idle word that we speak on Judgment Day. The scriptures say if you hate someone, you are a murderer. If you lust, you commit adultery. So God's standard is moral perfection in thought and word and in deed, and there's no way any of us are going to stand on Judgment Day without a Savior. And when we come to Christ, he makes us morally perfect in the sight of God. The Bible says we're given or imputed the righteousness of Christ. In other words, God makes us righteous by his grace. And that's what the song Amazing Grace is all about. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So uh, it's very important to examine yourself, see if you're in the faith, and if you're a hypocrite, if you're playing a pretender, come to your senses, get up out of the pigsty, and get back to the Father. But, I mean, people are told that you know, if they do, like you say, make a decision for, for Christ, or they, they open their heart to Jesus, or they say a, say a prayer, say a sinner's prayer, then, then they're saved, and, and that's all they have to do. But it seems like uh, the need to repent or the, the conviction of sin is, is a big part that's missing in that. Absolutely. If you're going to put a parachute on uh, when you're on a plane, 10,000 feet up and you're standing on the edge of the plane, you want to make sure that your parachute straps are tight. You don't want it loose because this is a big jump you're talking about. It's a fearful thing to hit the ground at 150 miles an hour. And each of us is standing on the edge of eternity. And the Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a free gift. And when you come to Christ, you make sure those straps are tight. Daily I examine myself and I say, as the psalmist says, search me, O God, know my heart, try me, and know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me, because I don't want hypocrisy in my life. I don't want sin to make me a hypocrite. So, yeah, it's vital to walk the walk, to uh, walk the straight and narrow, and it is a life of self-denial. You deny yourself the pleasure of sin, and on Judgment Day you'll be glad that you didn't play the hypocrite. You know, Ray, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that I oftentimes hear somebody say, oh, you know, I, I, never, I never heard it that way, or I never... I ne- I've heard that Jesus died for our sins, but I never knew why. I never knew what that meant. And even, even you and I were talking about the gospel or the modern gospel or false conversion. Uh, but t- to simplify it, how would, you, how would you explain that to somebody, what, what the gospel is and what it means? Well, our big error uh, as the modern church is that we have given the cure without first convincing of the disease. No doctor who wants his patient to esteem and appreciate his cure is going to uh, neglect telling his patient about the disease. That's the very thing that makes the patient embrace the cure. And what we've done as a modern church, then we don't want to really talk about sin and judgment and, and hell and righteousness and all this stuff. Let's just tell people that God loves them and that Jesus is the answer to their problems. Well, we've given the cure without convincing of the disease. And so the cure isn't esteemed nor appreciated. So that's the the, the convincing nature, uh, the convincing agent is the Ten Commandments. That, that's what shows us that we've sinned. And the, uh, the cure is the gospel. It's like when you get up in the, in the morning. What's the first thing most of us do? We go to the mirror and look at it. It's not a pretty sight. We've got a pale face, outstanding hairstyle, puffy eyes. And, and you think to yourself, I'm going to clean up before I go public. I've got to. And so you go from the mirror to the water to wash. Well, God's law, those Ten Commandments, are like a mirror. When we look into the perfect law of liberty, we should say, oh, we're all as an unclean thing and our righteousness is as filthy rags. And once we see ourselves in truth, that we're unclean in God's sight, we go from the mirror of the law to the water of the blood of Christ to wash. And that's the function of God's law. It doesn't help us. It just leaves us helpless. It reflects what we are in truth. A mirror isn't meant to wash us. It just sends us to the water. The Ten Commandments aren't meant to cleanse us. You don't, don't get right with God by keeping the Ten Commandments. They just show us that we're sinners, and that we need to go to the water of uh, the gospel. Uh, this is a question that came from uh, a pastor friend of mine. He says, and, and we touched on some of this already in, the, in our chat, um, so if you want to gloss over some of it. The question is this, pastors and clergy, the message comes from them, so what is the state of our clergy? And we've touched on that a little bit, but the part that I don't know that we did touch on is, uh, how do we reach them? How do we reach the pastors and the clergy? And... and and, and, and help clarify this message? Well, you know, it's, very, it's vital that we do. I was at a, an interdenominational prayer meeting many years ago, and I could pick who went to what church by the way they prayed. If I heard someone say, Father, when they prayed, I knew they went to John Steele's church because that's exactly how Pastor John Steele used to pray. And so pastors reproduce after their own kind. 
If you have a pastor that has no concern for the lost, he thinks evangelism is a gift, he never mentions the unsaved and the, and the reality of hell, that's how his congregation are going to be. But I encourage pastors to actually go into the world and play golf or play racquetball or do something where they rub shoulders with the unsaved so they have a burden for them. We're called to be in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom we shine as lights in the world and then come back and say, you know, I talked to an atheist while I was playing golf today and all he said, and the congregations will say, whoa, pastor actually condescends to the lowly task of evangelism and they will imitate him. They'll do what he does. And that's the key. And uh, we won't do that until we get a right understanding of God's character and nature. God is not a divine butler. He's not a celestial Santa Claus. He's to be feared. He's holy. He's perfect. He's righteous. And Paul said, woe to me if I preach not the gospel. So once we understand that God is to be feared, we'll say with the Apostle Paul, wherefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And that has to happen first in the pulpits, and then it will go through to the pews, and then once the church gets off its seat and does what it should, then we'll see America start turning back to God. I want to talk to you a little bit about, about witnessing. I mean, that's a big part of your ministry, and uh, even in 180, the movie, um, that, that's a big part of that, probably the, the final third of the movie, as well as, uh, as well as in the way the Master TV show as well. Could uh, I mention our website? Oh, livingwaters.com, that's right. Yeah, that would be great. There's actually a little video clip of the Duggar family. Heard of the Duggar family? Yes. The 19, I've got 19 kids that yeah. are on uh, TLC, the Learning Channel. They're kind of pro-life with 19 kids. We've got a little video of them using our gospel tracks, so people might like to look at that. It's a good introduction to the ministry. Uh, it's livingwaters.com, and then I posted that on my Twitter. You guys can find the link to that on my Twitter and the link to the, to the movie as well. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk to you, touch just briefly about, about witnessing. Um, how and the, the tracks are a good kind of avenue into that. How important it is is it in our Christian life to share the faith with people? Well, you know, there's something called relationship evangelism where many uh, Christians are told, "Look, you don't have to confront people; just build a relationship with them and get to know them." And and then when the subject comes up, you're about to address it. Well, I believe in relationship evangelism. When I meet a non-Christian, I'll build a relationship with them for maybe one, two minutes before I share the gospel. And the way I do it inoffensively is just say, "Hey, how you doing?" The guy says, good, good. I say, what's your name? He says, Bill. Bill, I'm Ray. Pleased to meet you. He says, oh, good to meet you, too. I say, Bill, I've got a question for you. He says, what's that? I say, what do you think happens when someone dies? Do you think there's an afterlife? Now, I haven't mentioned God or Jesus or the Bible or heaven or hell or judgment day or all those things that make people feel uncomfortable. I've just asked him for his opinion. What does he think happens after someone dies? And Bill says, oh, I don't know. I say, do you think about it much? He says, all the time. Now, his all the time just dissipates my fears. I think, oh, Bill's he's human. Uh -huh. He's not the Antichrist. He hasn't grabbed me around the throat and said, you horrible fundamental Bible basher. No, he's just a reasonable guy. So I say, well, uh, do you think there's a heaven? He says, yeah, I hope so. Shall you go in there? Are you a good person? He says, well, I sure hope I'm going there. I say, well, let, let's do a little test. So we'll go through some of the commandments. How many lies have you told in your life? He says, oh, a lot. So what do you call someone who tells a lot of lies? He says, oh, a liar. Have you ever stolen something? He says, yeah, yeah, just little things. I said, what do you call someone who steals? He says, a thief. I say, hey, Bill, have you ever used God's name in vain? He says, uh, yeah, it's a bad habit I've got. I say, Bill, that's using God's name as a cuss word. It's called blasphemy. It's very serious in God's eyes. He says, yeah, I know. I said, now, listen to this, Bill. Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever done that? He says, man, I do that all the time. So, well, Bill, I'm not judging you, but by your own admission, you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, and an adulterer at heart. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, you're going to be innocent or guilty. He says, man, I'll be guilty. So, will you go to heaven or hell? He says, I'll end up in hell. I said, does that concern you? He says, yeah, sure does. I said, well, look, you know what God did for human beings, for sinners, so we wouldn't have to go to hell? He suffered and died on the cross, took our punishment. We broke God's law, and Jesus paid our fine. That means God can legally dismiss our case. And then Jesus rose from the dead after he paid our fine, and all who repent and trust in him receive everlasting life. He says, hey, I've never heard this before. I said, well, thanks for listening to me. Do you have a Bible at home? He says, yeah, I do. I'm going to get into it. really appreciate this. And that's the biblical way to share your faith. And you can see Paul doing that in Romans chapter 2, where he says, you who say you shall not steal, do you steal? You say you shall not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? And it's the same thing Jesus did in Mark 10, verse 17, and we've moved way, way away from it and held up Jesus as a kind of life improver. You know, Jesus is better than booze. And this is a, that's a horrible uh, 
a horrible uh, way to present the gospel. Um, I, I have one more thing before uh, before we say goodbye. Um, you, you mentioned the website, uh, livingwaters.com, and, and through that website, you can find a link to uh, the Way of the Master website. And there's something on that on that site that I wanted to ask you about. Um, Ten principles for new Christians. Uh, it's another question that came from a listener. What signs should a person be looking for? Uh, you know, you've witnessed to them, and they, you know, you, it's some, the message comes through, and it, it's reached them. What signs then should that person be looking for in themselves to know that they're right with God, the newly converted? What should they be, what should they be seeing? Well, the Bible speaks of fruit. If I plant a tree in my backyard and it says peach tree on the tree, it's a label, and two years go past, there's no peaches, I'm going to cut it down because it's just filling up my ground. So fruit is what proves the genuineness of the tree, and fruit is what proves the genuineness of the Christian. Jesus said, by your fruits you shall be known. So there should be a fruit of righteousness. We should love that which is right and pleasing in God's sight. A fruit of praise and thanksgiving. There should be a new heart that just loves God and gives him praise for his creation. When I became a Christian... I couldn't believe it. Trees look different. I mean, <laughs> trees look like they're lifting up their branches and praise to God. The fruits and the birds and the sunrise, everything just gave praise to God. And, and so I was just so filled with thanksgiving. I was a new person that didn't think about God for one minute before I was a Christian and couldn't stop thinking about God for the past 40 years. So there's a fruit of praise, fruit of thanksgiving, the fruit of repentance. That means you'll be continually sorry and turning from any hypocrisy or sin in your life. And then there's the fruit of the Spirit. There should be a love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, generous, faith, meekness, and temperance. We should have those fruits that are clearly manifest in the life of Christians. So if you've got someone who's uh, lying and stealing and looking at pornography and they're playing the hypocrite and they've got an anger problem and, a, and, a, and, a, and they're uh, lust-filled and uh, covetous, you know, there's something radically wrong and they need to go back to square one and examine themselves to see if they have the faith before death seizes upon them and their eternal uh, destiny is sealed. Um, I want to make a point to mention the, the websites again and where people... The, the movie, 180 The Movie, it's, it's free. Anybody can watch it. It's up there for everybody, 180movie.com. Uh, the website uh, is livingwaters.com, uh, where you can find out a bunch of different resources, information, uh, and even get some uh, tracks and things like that. Uh, well, Ray, we talked about it a lot today. What, what, if you could... This is the one thing I kept thinking I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask you. If you could leave... Our listeners, you know, some many who probably have never heard you speak before, many who probably have never even heard this message before, if you could leave them with one thought or you could tell them one thing, what would it be? I would say don't put off your eternal salvation until tomorrow because tomorrow may not come right now. Get on your knees and surrender your life to Christ. Give him everything. Say, Lord, you gave me life and breath and eyesight and hearing and ability to think. I give it all back to you. Please forgive my sins. I trust in you daily, and then read the Bible daily and obey what you read. You'll never be the same. 150,000 people die every 24 hours, and all of them probably would have been planning for tomorrow, and it never came. So we're talking about your eternal salvation. It's more, more serious than a heart attack. So please, please uh, take to heart the things you've been hearing today. I would recommend, if you haven't heard it, going to the website and listening to Hell's Best Kept Secret as well. Um, it's helped me a lot listening to it. In fact, I've listened to it. Listen to it a lot, Ray. Uh, I appreciate the time today. Thank you so much for, for hanging out with us. Oh, I really appreciate you having me on your program. Thanks, Jared. Well, I hope we have some time to do it again sometime. 1141, this is WGMD Marine Weather Fox News uh, on the way.